turns out that the first uses of the Sherman Antitrust Act were actually against unions. That the, if you know your history of the United States, after Grant is president in the 1800s, all the next presidents until Teddy Roosevelt are one-term presidents. Uh, William McKinley gets elected but shot. So, But basically, up for 30 years, we have you know, one, these one-term presidents, and they are all seriously pro-business. So the railroad workers go out on strike. The government sends the army in to end the strike. They're not pro-labor. They're pro-business. Okay? And this gives rise, this is part of what gives rise to the progressive movement in the United States, is the antitrust laws are being used to argue that unions are monopolies, they're in restraint of trade, and to free companies from having to deal with unions. All right? Teddy Roosevelt becomes president. Teddy Roosevelt decides to enforce the antitrust laws. There's lots of people on the far right that said he did it because he was mad at J.P. Morgan, and it wasn't that he was some great crusader, that he just was mad at J.P. Morgan, but however that goes, we don't care. The government starts to go after these big monopoly companies and these cartels. So the the first big case that we all know about, there's other cases, there's a whole history of cases, but the first big case that we deal with is always the Standard Oil case. The Rockefellers controlled most of... Um, oil production in the United States, oil refining, railroads, transportation, right? There was a rise, there are people again who argue that there was a rising oil center in Texas at that point when Standard Oil's busted up, the oil production is mostly up in the north, but this Texas area is just starting to grow. And so there are people who say we didn't really need to do this because the Texas producers would have, um, ended the monopoly anyhow, but you don't really know that that would have happened. Standard Oil goes to the Supreme Court in 1911. They lose, and that one company is so large, it's split into 34 companies. So you get Chevron, Arco, Amoco, Exxon, Mobil, right? You get all of these companies that you may know and recognize now. Standard Oils get split into 34 different oil companies. All right, 34. Now, when it does this, the court, however, also applies and creates something called the rule of reason. Remember that the Sherman Antitrust Act just says monopoly is illegal. Well, the Supreme Court said that is too narrow and we're not going to take that. What we're going to say is people have to look at the business situation and decide if what's going on is reasonable or not. The rule of reason. So yes, yeah, Saran Wrap is the only maker of clear plastic wrap, but they're not in violation of the antitrust laws because the jury decides it's reasonable for them. If you're the only maker of something, but it's such a small industry that, right, there's no room for two, or or your product is just so much better. Microsoft has argued this, and we'll talk about them here in a second. Microsoft kind of tried to argue when they were sued that their reason they were a monopoly is that their product was just so much better than everybody else's. And after people got done laughing, they had to come up with other arguments. Okay? Juries and judges who are adjudicating this are allowed to use their own sense of reasonable. And if they think what's going on, if there's two companies and one of them is just mismanaged and goes out of business, that does not make the other one in violation of the antitrust laws. Until a new company starts to come in and they do try to stop it, now they're in violation. But if you become a monopoly because you're good at what you do or because there's some weird accident, or you're not in violation of the antitrust laws. Okay, Reasonable. The court says... We have to interpret this with our sense of reason. What's reasonable? All right. Now, we added more laws. So the Clayton Act gets passed in 1914, and this is all part of this whole progressive movement in the United States. The Clayton Act exempts labor from the antitrust laws. It says labor is not a commodity and exempts labor from the antitrust act. It technically outlaws price discrimination. But again, what's reasonable? is offering old people cheap coffee 
unreasonable? And the answer is no. Okay. Is Microsoft deciding who is going to get what price on Windows based on whether Bill Gates likes them or not unreasonable? Yeah, apparently. Okay. Uh, tying contracts. So an example of this, of a tying contract, tying contract says if you buy one thing, you've got to buy something else. So when Xerox invents the copy machine, not only did you have to buy the copier from them, you had to buy your toner from them, and you had to buy your paper from them. Okay, they eventually get sued, obviously, and lose, because why should you have to buy your paper from Xerox if just because you own their copy machine, okay? So these tying contracts prevent competition, okay? You own a Xerox, you have to buy your toner from them. Well, there's other companies out there that could make the toner, and we could get cheaper toner and cheaper paper, and you with me? And Xerox doesn't want that to happen, so they created these tying contracts. It gets busted up. It also outlaws something called interlocking directorates. So we have Caesars and MGM in Las Vegas, and they're competing with each other, sort of. What would happen if the same people sat on the board of directors of both companies? Well, they wouldn't be technically a monopoly, but they could act like one, right? MGM could make decisions based on what Caesars is doing, and Caesars can make decisions based on what MGM is doing, right? And there'd be a lot of collusion going on. So the law says you cannot sit on the boards of directors of competing companies. That's called interlocking directorates. So if you sit on the board of directors of General Motors, you cannot sit on the board of directors of Ford. If you sit on the board of directors of American Airlines, you cannot sit on the board of directors of Southwest. Right? You cannot sit on multiple boards of directors of competing companies. Clayton Act also gives the government the right to regulate mergers. So if two companies want to merge, the government gets to decide. So when MGM and, and Mirage merge, the government decides whether or not that works. These laws are modified by the Robinson-Patman Act in 1936 and by the keller kefauver Act in 1950. And those things put specific, specific acts in there. One of the things that happens on this is the creation of the Federal Trade Commission. So from the Robinson-Patman Act and keller kefauver we get rules about things that businesses can and cannot do. So, for example, you can't do what's called bait and switch. Watch TV commercials, and sometimes there'll be a car company, a car dealership, and they're going, look, we have this brand new car, and it's $9,999. Come on by. Well, down in little type at the bottom of the screen, it'll say, we only have one that's at this price, and it might be gone by the time you get here. Okay, bait and switch is I advertise that I have something and it's at this great price. And when you get to the store, it's gone. I used it to get you into the store. I baited you. And now I try to switch you to something else that's more expensive. That's illegal. You have to tell the truth when you're advertising. Except, except, except Congress exempted politicians from having to tell the truth. So all other businesses, all businesses have to have the truth in advertising. Listerine used to advertise that they cured the common cold, that if you gargled with Listerine, it cured the common cold. And the government eventually went to them and said, do you have any proof that Listerine cures the common cold? And they, Listerine went, wait, everybody knows it, come on. Well, now Listerine advertises they kill, you know, 99% of the germs, that, but they can't say they cure the common cold because they couldn't prove that, in fact, Listerine cured the common cold. Politicians are allowed to lie. They are not subject to truth in advertising laws. Everybody else is, but not politicians. So the Federal Trade Commission is there to make sure that businesses operate in ethical, moral ways, okay, governed by what's in Robinson Patman and Keller Kefauver. Exciting? Okay. So we already talked a little bit about price fixing. Price fixing is when two companies get together and they decide what prices are going to be. That's always illegal. It's called per se. It's just always illegal. If Walmart calls up Target and they decide what the price is going to be on something, that's illegal. Can't do that. Okay? Tying contracts, we already talked about that. You cannot force someone to buy something 
a second thing because they bought the first thing. Okay? Cannot force them. Now, if you're General Motors, you can say, hey, if you put a non-General Motors part in your car that violates the warranty, you can do that. But you can't say, if you put a non-General Motors part in this car, we get the car back. And it doesn't matter that you own it. Right? You can't force them to only use General Motors parts in the General Motors car. You can take the warranty away, but you can't force them to buy General Motors parts. Predatory pricing. Your book says that there's no evidence of predatory pricing, and yet Walmart has been fined millions of dollars all over the country for predatory pricing. Predatory pricing is when I price low, very low, with the intent of driving out my competition. Okay? So there's a little town in Nevada called Ely. Little town in Nevada called Ely. They had all these mom and pop businesses. In comes Walmart, starts up, sells really low, wipes out all the mom and pop businesses, then raises their prices. Okay? Walmart has done this all over the country. They've been sued repeatedly all over the country. They had a, a thing with Target going on in parts of the country where the, you know, the government ended up antitrusting them because they were selling. Okay? Predatory pricing. To do predatory pricing, you have to actually sell below your cost. So if you buy this product for $10, you're selling it for 9 or 8 or 7 Okay? On the theory that your competitors... On the theory that your competitors have less money than you, they can't survive selling products below cost, but you're Walmart, you're this giant company, you can. Standard Oil was accused of using predatory pricing to wipe out its competitors, that because they were this giant company, they could go to small towns and wipe out the gas stations in those towns by selling oil at a really low price. Okay? So... <sighs> Whether there is predatory pricing or not in the world, the government certainly thinks so, and Walmart's, again, paid lots of fines for predatory pricing, and so have other companies. But, you know, you can argue that maybe that's not really what they did or whatever. Um, your judgment on that. And then mergers. And we talk about mergers here in a second. We'll come back to mergers. They have this same thing in Europe. They don't call it antitrust. They call it competition policy. Both the United States and the European Union have sued Microsoft and fined Microsoft a lot of money. The United States actually has been easier on Microsoft than Europe was. And again, what upset Europe, what upset the European Union the most, is two things. One, Windows in Europe and in the United States, it comes with it used to be Internet Explorer, now it's Edge. It comes with a browser. It comes with a media player. It comes with all these accoutrements. Well, the Europeans said, take those out. People should get to choose their browser. They should get to choose their uh, media player. Microsoft said to the U.S., who said the same thing, it's impossible. The U.S. said, okay. Europe said, do it. And so Microsoft released a separate version of Windows, which was only available in Europe, that did not come with Internet Explorer and did not come with Media Player. And when you started it up, you got to choose what browser you wanted and what Media Player you wanted. Okay? And the second thing that upset Europe, the second thing, was that Microsoft wanted to do more than just run PCs. So Microsoft wanted to be in cable boxes. They wanted cable boxes to run on Windows. They wanted telephones to run on Windows. They wanted... Um, televisions to run on Windows. All this other stuff, they wanted it to run on Windows. Okay? The Europeans basically stopped them. The United States wouldn't have stopped them. I don't know that you really would have wanted Windows. I just had this vision of, you know, having a, being on an airplane where Windows is running the airplane, and just as we're coming into land, there's the blue screen of death, and... But... Most of the world, most of these things run on something called Linux. And we'll talk about that here in a minute again. And so there's this third operating system. Most computers 
that we run into every day don't have Linux, but my television's a Linux, and my cable box is a Linux box. Okay? And in fact, Apple is sort of, but we'll get there. Uh, both the United States and Europe have problems with Google. Google. Google not only controls almost all searches, it controls a huge percentage of all the advertising. So even if, even if you're not directly on Google, you have some other website, the ads on that website might be coming through Google. And that scares the Europeans. That means that Google can affect who, and it should scare us. Google can decide what you see in a search. Google can give weights to things that they like and not weights to things that they don't like. Their algorithm's a secret. Okay, um, You can pay them to put things up higher in the searches. So during political campaigns, very often nowadays, uh, one party will pay Google. For example, uh, when George W. Bush is running for re-election, if you type the word, I think it was liar, into Google, uh, the first thing that came up was George W. Bush. Okay, So you can manipulate Google by paying them. It's a problem. Most countries have some form of antitrust law, and most states, basically, have their own little antitrust laws. So sometimes we try to merge, right? Mergers happen, and sometimes we don't allow these mergers to happen because there's something going on. AT&T and T-Mobile tried to merge. And you know AT&T is going to be a problem. Any company that has the Death Star as their logo, you're not really sure you can trust them. AT&T and T-Mobile wanted to merge. The government decided no. And the reason the government decided no, in theory, is that the, the H index was too high. There was too much concentration in the telephone industry. And if we let T-Mobile and AT&T merge, there would be insufficient amount of competition in the cell phone business, and that would be bad for consumers. Okay? On the other hand... There was a company in Las Vegas. There used to be a movie theater chain called Sufi. They got bought out. But there were 10 different movie theater companies in Las Vegas. Okay, If you had come here in the 80s and the early 90s, there were no movie theaters in hotels. The movie theaters were all standalone businesses out in the community. Okay, And they were owned by all sorts of different companies. UNLV students got half-price movie tickets at every movie theater in town. So you could take your Rebel card, and professors could do this too because we have Rebel cards. You could go to any movie theater in town and get a half-price uh, movie ticket, made dating cheap. Okay? This company, Siufi, comes in, and they buy up all of the movie theaters in town except for one. All of them except for one. That one theater holds out. So Siufi writes a letter to the movie studios, because Siufi owned, at that point, they owned a huge percentage of the movie theaters in California, and now they owned all but one of the movie theaters in Las Vegas, and they said, you have to stop, you have to stop providing movies to this one last holdout movie theater in Vegas, or we're going to stop showing your movies all over California. So now, the movie the this one holdout movie theater in Vegas has to stop um, has to sell out to Siufi, and now Siufi owns all the movie theaters in Vegas, and they stop the half-price deal for students and raise all the movie prices. Okay, That's clearly a violation of the antitrust laws. There isn't even a doubt that that's a violation of the antitrust laws. But the Reagan administration, so see, the theater, the guy who had to sell out, sues them, right? Individuals can sue. The Reagan administration actually wrote the judge a letter and asked him to drop the lawsuit, which he did. Exciting? So you used to get half-price tickets at movies. You don't anymore. MGM, Mandalay Bay, and Mirage all merge. Caesars and Park Place merge. There's all these mergers in Vegas. If you Again, if you had come to Vegas in the early 90s, nobody owned more than two hotels. It was monopolistic competition, basically. But now it's oligopoly. And the reason it's oligopoly is all these mergers were allowed. By the numbers, those mergers should not have been allowed. But the Nevada congressional delegation asked the FTC to approve the mergers anyway, and so they were approved. 
Disney and Fox tried to merge. The government didn't allow that because they thought it would get rid of too much competition. Disney owns everything, right? Disney owns Star Wars and uh, Marvel and everything. Aetna and Humana, which are two of the biggest healthcare companies in America, tried to merge, and the government stopped it because they thought it would be bad for competition in the healthcare world. Okay? On the other hand, they've approved mergers between all sorts of airlines, United and Continental merge, American and America West, and U.S. Air all merge, oil companies merge, right? BP and Amoco merge, Exxon and Mobil merge. So they've allowed all these mergers that Lessen competition for consumers. All right. Let's go talk about externalities. <laughs>